Hi, my name is Michelle Doran with Elite Healthcare, and today we're talking to Dr. Cinda Rushton, who is the Ann and George Bunting Professor of Clinical Ethics and Nursing at Johns Hopkins University, and we're talking about moral resilience. Dr. Rushton, tell us a little bit more about yourself and your important work, please. Well, good morning. Uh, it's such a pleasure to be here. And uh, you know, all of us in nursing start, uh, at least for me, at the bedside. Uh, I started my career in the pediatric intensive care unit. And, you know, that's a place where there's lots of ethical questions and um, lots of questions that really just don't have answers. And over time, I started realizing that I I was carrying a lot of residue from those kinds of situations and um, began to, you know, try to give voice to what were the situations that were kind of weighing us down. And over time, uh, began to talk about the concept of uh, caregiver suffering. Back in 1992, I wrote an article about that. And um, since then, have spent a lot of time exploring, you know, the sort of causes of, of moral suffering. Um, and then about five years ago, I, um, I thought I was writing a book proposal on um, moral distress. And I realized that I just, I just couldn't finish the proposal. And I thought, you know, this is crazy. What's wrong with me? And so I ended up pausing and asking myself the question of, we know that there's a lot of moral distress. It's been studied for three decades and we don't have a lot of solutions. And so I kept asking myself, and what else is possible? And in that exploration, I came across the um, concept of moral resilience. And I began to um, explore what is this concept and to conceptualize it. And um, we have a work in progress uh, in terms of trying to understand it. We've done some empirical work. Uh, we have a, a tool now that measures moral resilience that's been validated and lots of conceptual work as well as um, empirical work trying to look at um, how we can capture both the distress that nurses and others are experiencing, but also to point toward the inner capacities that nurses have that allow them to meet these challenges in ways that don't disable them. Mm -hmm. So it's been quite an interesting journey and one that is continuing to be uh, very um, rich and um, very generative at this point. Mm -hmm. So you talked about or touched upon what moral resilience is, but is there a definition that you like to use or that so, is widely used? Yeah, so um, there are a number of definitions. The de definitions that we uh, use in our work is the ability of an individual to preserve or restore integrity in response to some kind of moral adversity. And that moral adversity could be um, challenges that have to do with patients, um, mm -hmm. questions about, you know, how do I do the right thing when I have constraints or when I'm confused or uncertain? Mm -hmm. It can also be related to the system that we work in and the ways in which our system create different types of moral suffering, um, things that uh, end up feeling leaving us with feelings of betrayal or feeling as if we are not being supported or we mm. don't have a voice or we are silenced when we try to have a voice. Mm -hmm. And so um, it's a concept that um, I think deserves some clarification because there's a narrative uh, in, in our world and in our field that somehow um, suggesting that people are resilient is a, a, an indictment that somehow they are deficient in some way. Hmm. And the way that we approach this is the assumption that everyone has the capacity, everyone is born whole, and that we um, 
have that innate capacity within us and that it's possible to amplify mm. what's already there. Mm. And so we, we sort of approach it from a strengths-based um, approach. And the, the image that I like to use to illustrate um, moral resilience is the practice that's done in Japan called Kintsuji. This is where you take a piece of pottery that is broken and normally our instinct would be to throw away the pieces. But in Japan, what this practice is about is taking those broken pieces and putting them back together with golden paint and cement to create a new vessel. And to, instead of overlooking the broken parts, but to actually honor them. And so to me, moral resilience is restoring that sense of wholeness, even when things are broken, when mm. things have fallen apart, <laughs> that we can restore ourselves in a way that um, may even lead to growth. Um, it may lead to greater insight. And so that's the sort of image that I think really represents um, more resilience. It's not about being complicit. It's not about putting a bow on a bad situation <laughs> or pretending that everything's great. It's not at all. It's actually turning toward those parts that are broken and seeing them clearly and honestly. That's a wonderful image and a really strong one too. I like that a lot. So moral resilience is getting a lot of heightened attention um, through the pandemic and also today, very timely, um, at least the heels of the crisis in the United States. Um, why now? Why so important? It, I imagine because it's, it's an offering of hope and strength, but can you talk about that? Yes, it's a, um, I think the pandemic has, has really, um, revealed in very stark terms, the kind of moral suffering and moral burden that clinicians and nurses in particular have mm. carried. And I think that it's happened in such um, stark ways that it's not possible for us to deny it any longer. And I think that people are looking for a vision of hope. Um, we are, you know, sort of a hopeful species in many ways. And that doesn't mean that we're, you know, sort of um, Pollyanna in that. But I think for us to keep uh, putting our one foot in front of the other, there is a necessary fuel of hope. And so when I think about this concept of moral resilience, I think that it gives us uh, an alternative to being so um, overwhelmed by the despair and the moral residue of these really hard situations that people mm -hmm. have faced. You know, we, we, it's interesting. And some people will say, this is exactly what we've, signed up for. I don't know anybody who really signed up for what we've done this last year mm -hmm. in this way. And so there's a need for healing. And I think moral resilience can be one of those paths toward healing. Absolutely. Um, let's close if we could, um, Dr. Rushton was sharing some some practical strategies for nurses um, to use in their practice around moral resilience, if we could, please. So um, when I think of, you know, how do we actually harness our moral resilience? The first part is we have to know who we are and what we stand for. Mm -hmm. And nurses have um, a very clear commitment to their patients. And so knowing that is our grounding is a really important way in the midst of these challenges to come back to what really matters and connecting to why am I here? Mm -hmm. And that can happen in a breath. It can happen as you put your hand on the doorknob to open a patient's mm -hmm. room, as you put your PPE on to take a breath and remember why am I here? because it can be a resource. It can be a guide to say, this is what needs attention. And 
over and over again, you know, when you think about feeling overwhelmed with so many things, if you can come back to why am I here and really stay focused on that, then some of the noise can start dissipating a little bit. Mm. I think another part of integrity is um, really setting realistic expectations of ourselves and others. Nurses have a tendency to expect um, ourselves to fix unfixable problems. We expect ourselves to be able to withstand um, all kinds of adversity. And we don't give ourselves much of a break. And so I think we have to let go of the expectation that we can fix these unfixable problems. And Mm -hmm. there are a lot of them right now. And so that means focusing on what is right in front of you. You know, if you think about what we do as a nurse, when you do an assessment, you focus right on that person. You listen to their lungs. You, you listen to their complaints, their symptoms. So being able to, to let go of things that are beyond our control and to um, accept that we do have limitations and that mm-hmm. they're not a sign of failure. They are a sign that we are in a situation where the demands have exceeded our capacities. And we need to be able to speak up and speak out about that. And so part of this is also befriending the uncertainty. There's a lot of uncertainty right now. And when we are afraid, we become rigid and it's hard for us to feel safe and to feel open and caring and compassionate for ourselves and others. And it's also true, and and I know I've done this a lot in the pandemic, is we fight with reality. You know, I don't want this pandemic to be going. I don't wanna wear my mask. I don't wanna have to take care of these very sick patients who I worry are not gonna get better. Mm. So being able to conserve our energy and to put our energy into things that actually we can make a difference in that are modifiable rather than railing against, you know, all these things that honestly are outside of our ability to to control. And the Mm. last thing I would say is one of the key elements of moral resilience is self-stewardship. And what that means is being able to know ourselves well enough that we know what capacities we have, we know our limits, we are able to um, declare what those limits are, what our boundaries are, to say no with integrity, and to invest in our well being as not a, a sign of indulgence, but of a necessity because we have as nurses, a moral imperative to invest in our own well-being and integrity, Mm -hmm. and it's not optional. So we need to figure out what is it that we need to be whole and to be willing to invest in exactly those things. These are such important messages. Thank you for sharing your expertise with us today. 